Hey everybody, my name is Micah Abbott. Uh, I work at Red Hat on the Red Hat Core OS project. Uh, I'm going to talk about Fedora Silverblue. Uh, this is going to be a very general overview for folks who have never seen it before, never heard about it before. You should come away with a better idea of what it is, what kind of technologies go into it, and uh, why it's uh, better than Fedora Workstation, in my opinion. Um, so who's actually heard of Fedora Silverblue before? Who's actually using it? Okay, good, a couple users. Um, some of the technology behind it are like, is like OS tree and RPM OS tree. Anybody use that, heard of that? Containers, flat packs? All right, great. So let's start with just the basics. What's Silverblue? It's part of Fedora. It's officially recognized, officially supported by the Fedora community and the Fedora Project Council. Um, it uses the same RPMs that Fedora produces for all their other uh, distributions, workstation and server and whatnot. It uses, utilizes containers very heavily for sandbox, sandboxing your applications off the host. Flatpaks as well as a way to distribute your GUI applications in, in a container format. Uh, it's also an immutable host, and I'll get into a little more details about that. And it could be the future. I'm living the future right now, just like Doc Emmett Brown is. So an immutable host. Uh, I made up this, this quote by myself, it's where the OS is delivered in such a way where OS modification is not expected with an asterisk because there are ways you can modify the OS, but generally it's treated as a uh, mutable object. So in the server world, this uh, the immutable host is is commonly refer has may have been referred to as you've heard of uh, cattle or uh, the new paradigm is elephants. Uh, they're disposable hosts. We can. Uh, recreate them easily because it's a fixed uh, uh, fixed image, uh, delivered as an image or image-like format. Previously, we've seen things like uh, CentOS, Fedora, and Red Hat Atomic Hosts, uh, Container Linux from the Core OS guys, and then Endless OS. Uh, now, why would we want this on the desktop? Well, it, having an immutable host, we get we gain things like better security because we can't easily touch the actual uh, OS bits on the on the host. Uh, in the case of Atomic, uh, I'm sorry, Silverblue and other OS tree based systems, the way it, the updates, the OS is delivered is transactional, so you have safer upgrades. Uh, and I'll get into all these details a little, in a little further along. So let's talk about how Silverblue is similar to Workstation. Uh, as I said earlier, they both share the same RPMs from Fedora ecosystem, so you don't need any new special package format or anything. RPMs work just fine. You can install RPMs on Fedora Silverblue uh, slightly differently than you would on Workstation, uh, and both can run containers and flat packs. Differences start to show up in the file system mutability. So on Silverblue, only var and etc are writable. Uh, why is this important? Well, here's an example of why a mutable slash user uh, partition or, or uh, part of the file system would be bad. It's, this is a screenshot I grabbed from a uh, installer for NVIDIA drivers, I believe. There is a one character error, the space between slash user and slash lib. So it nukes your entire user partition, which is very bad. If we ran this script against Silverblue, it would just fail to run because slash user is immutable. Uh, Silverblue has a different upgrade mechanism than Workstation. We have support for an atomic transactional updates via uh, OS tree and RPM OS tree. And during this the upgrade process, your running system is not touched. So if something goes wrong, you can uh, it, your your existing deployment is still functional, and you don't have to reboot uh, to try to uh, bail out of the error. Um, it's so it's it, it's really so rugged that you can actually pull the power on the Silverblue host and you can recover just by rebooting. The trade-off being that to get into your upgraded uh, version of the OS, you do need to reboot the host. Why is this good? Well, here's another screenshot I grabbed off uh, Adam Williamson. He's a uh, his blog. He's a Fedora QE engineer, and he talks about how in 
I think it was Fedora, yeah, Fedora 24 release, there was an upgrade uh, DNF problem where if you had a certain uh, hybrid GPU on your system and you upgraded from the desktop, it would crash X and then you wouldn't be able to get back into your X session. And it's uh, that kind of shows how when upgrades are touching your running system, bad things can happen. The upgrades are also delivered differently. So Workstation uses RPMs. If you've ever done a DNF upgrade, you know that it's just pulling down RPMs from your, your DNF repo. Silverblue delivers the, up, the upgrades and the OS itself via OS tree commits. Um, and, and like I said earlier, both can install packages as RPMs. So Silverblue sort of uh, threads the needle between both of those in terms of the, it can support RPMs, but mostly OS is delivered through an OS tree commit. So what is OS3, an RPM OS3? Uh, so OS3 is, uh, can be simplified as Git for an operating system or Git for a file system. Uh, you can, you basically can write out a file system, check it into an OS3 repo, and then check out that, that commit uh, in a new file system tree somewhere. Uh, the files are checksummed and tracked in a content addressable object store, deduplicated through hard links. Uh, it also handles the bootloader configuration and management of slash etc when you're uh, uh, when you're doing upgrades so if you have one version of a config file at etc and there's a new version coming in as well as modifications you made there's a three-way merge process that happens so uh, everything is happy so rpm os3 from the documentation is hybrid image package system it uses lib os3 underneath the covers to uh, uh, track the rpms that are going into the compose uh, the RPMs are uh, consumed on the server side when you're making the OS3 com commit, the OS3 compose, and then on the client side as well when you want to install packages. Uh, RPM OS3 is also a CLI uh, binary, so you can, that is the primary entry point for how you would manage your OS. And I'll show you some live demos in a little bit. Well, we'll start with this one. Uh, so RPM OS3 status, that will give you the status of the, D the RPM OS3 daemon, um, whether or not you have automatic upgrades configured, uh, information about the deployment, like versions, commits, checksums, GPG signatures, and I can also report security advisories that have been fixed in a new version. So here we go. Let's do it live. So there we see that. So there's, I have, this is a VM I've got booted up on my system. Everybody see that okay? Beggar, please. Say when? I, I just, of course, Dan. Thanks, thanks, Dan. Put on your glasses. Um, so this is a, like I said, VM that I booted. It has a single deployment. It's got an old version of Silver Blue. It's from August 2nd. You can see there's a commit sum uh, attached to it. It's been signed. The commit itself has been signed by the Fedora release key. Uh, if I upgrade. Hopefully this works. We'll see that it's uh, pulling down the new ob new file objects from the commit, writing them in, write them into the new deployment. Uh, my, my running system is still perfectly functional. If I wanted to, I could hard reset the VM right now, but I'm not, I don't want to live dangerously right now. Um, and afterwards, it prints out a big summary of all the packages that changed, what have been upgraded, uh, any packages that have been added or removed or even downgraded. If we do RPM OS3 status dash A, we should see, all oh, right, I don't have package layers. Uh, that's why I wanted it. Dang. Well, if I had prepped this demo correctly, you would have seen all the CVs that got fixed in this, uh, in this new version. So, dang, that's it. So, but as you can see, the, the dot here on the bottom one, let me bring it up a little bit, uh, indicates this is the version I'm still booted into. The new version is staged at the top. That's the next one I'll, re I'll reboot into. So if I just do... Start the reboot process. Wait for it to come back up. Over here, you can see this is what 
VM is doing. Looks like a normal Fedora install. There's nothing special about it. Like I said, it had, still uses, I mean, for, we still install via Anaconda. So we have ISOs that install uh, just fine. It uses the same GNOME interface. I'm just using the, the, the CLI since it's easier to demonstrate right now. And now you can see I booted into the new version and everything works fine. So back to the slides. So I showed you upgrade. Um, during the upgrade process, you can actually commit, uh, you can actually combine package layering operations. So package layering is what we refer to as when you're installing a package on top of the base OS or removing packages from the base OS or overriding packages. And I'll show you those commands as well. Um, I showed you how the system is left unchanged. You remain in the old boot, old deployment until you reboot. What if the upgrade is bad? So if I want to go back to the previous version for some reason, I can just uh, use RPM OS rollback and it will reorder the boot, uh, the boot entries. And when I reboot, I get into the, the previous version. Uh, it will actually print out the differences as well. If for some reason you can't get to uh, RPM OS rollback, rollback, but you can access the grub menu, you can just pick the old version in the grub menu and try to recover from that point. So. Since I promised you a demo, we're just going to do a rollback. It shows that we're moving, uh, moving back to the previous commit on the system. Prints out the changes. Uh, so you can see the packages that were added have been removed. And packages that were previously upgraded have been downgraded. And it's just reboot to get back in. And I'm just going to move along so I don't run out of time. One of the cool things about RPM OS3 is that you can actually switch major versions. So if you're uh, in the workstations scenario, when you wanted to go from Fedora 30 to Fedora 31 or 28 to 29, etc., it's like a DNF system upgrade or whatever the command is. I haven't used it in such a long time. Um, here, it's, we use a rebase operation. Um, has similar mechanics. It, it's checking out the new deployment. Doesn't touch your, your, your running system. It's completely safe. Uh, allows you to like test and reproduce issues on older versions. So if I'm running Fedora 30, but someone's, for some reason, is using Fedora 29, I could actually boot into Fedora 29, maybe test, test out that package, test out that bug. Um, I could also change out the entire OS. So if you want to really live dangerously and switch from Fedora Atomic, um, a Fedora Solar Blue, and run, say, CentOS Atomic Host, because they're both OS, both OS tree based systems, we can support this. This one's going to take, this one could take some time. Uh, I don't have it in my command history. All right, uh, let's see. So I have a, an OS3 remote configured on my host. I'm trying to, I want to show you how I'm going to rebase to a CentOS uh, deployment. So I've queried the uh, OS3 remote. You can see I have the silver blue ref spec and a, an atomic host ref spec. So I can do sudo rpm OS3 right. Yeah. That commit signed by the uh, CentOS uh, GPG key, so I, I missed that part of the demo as well. Oh, this is not really going the way I wanted to. Okay. Well, deal with it. <laughs> package layering. So, in my opinion, package layering is sort of like the last resort. You want to try to package your applications in containers or flat packs. However, there are cases where you can't do that. Like, for example, libvirt, you want to have on the host because it's a host extension. PSC Lite, I think, is a card reading prog program uh, for key cards, but um, I haven't used it. Um, so when you do, do this, the pack la package layering operations, it actually creates a new OS tree commit that has the changes based on the base uh, OS commit that you have, that you're running currently. 
Um, you can override base packages as well with uh, Arcane OS 3 override, remove or replace. Um, and any changes you, you make to that base OS through package laying operations uh, are also tracked and can be upgraded uh, during the upgrade process. Uh, so in install and uninstall extendings the OS, replace and remove to, to, to modify the base OS. Let's try another demo and see how it goes. Uh, I'm going to use something simple, just install JQ. So what it's doing is uh, it's actually creating a new tree. It's going to get the same metadata we get from DNF repos on Fedora Workstation and then download that RPM and install it as part of uh, this package layering operation. And of course, the slowest part is getting metadata because there's a ton of it. It's going to take forever, so I'm just going to try and move forward. We can come back to that in a little bit. So containers, container tools, another big part of Silverblue. If, if you haven't heard, containers are Linux. This is a something the Red Hat's been drumming, uh, drumming their, their, their making noise with their drum boat, um, except for jails and zones. They have T-shirts, exactly. You might have seen some T-shirts around here. Um, so they use C groups and usernames. How many people, is everybody familiar with containers? Should I run through the basics of containers? You don't know anything? Oh, Antonio, I feel so bad for you. Um, if you, uh, the, new, so the new tools that we have, because we're, we're moving away from Docker, thanks to Dan's hard work and his team. Uh, if you've been in Dan Walsh's talks, everything you're going to see here is probably old news, because he's covered it all. Uh, we've got build up, Podman, Scopio. We use Builder to build our container images, Podman to run and manage our containers, as well as pods. Uh, Scopio, we can use to inspect our remote registries, copy container images between different storage formats. And the new thing is Toolbox, uh, which is a way, which is a small shell program that uh, is included with Silverblue, which allows you to create a pet container where you can install your tools that you use on day to day. So think of it as you know, a place where you can install your development libraries, your development tools, GCC, all that kind of stuff. And it sticks around with the host unless you want to create a new one. So this presents a new option for container developers where Podman's a little more attractive <laughs> than Docker. <laughs> so if you've been in any of Dan's talks or any of uh, the container team's talks recently, you know that build a um, you can build images using Docker files. You can use sh you can shell script it um, to, to install packages into a mounted container. It supports the different OCI formats. Um, I'm going to go right back to this VM to see if it actually worked. Yeah, it did. So going back to the package layering operation, you can see uh, the output the, re the result. It downloaded the packages. It installed it. Ran the the, the scripts uh, safely in the background. And we have the two packages added. When we inspect the output of our PMS3 status, you can see that running system is still unchanged. If I try to do JQ right now, it's not there. Uh, we have a layered package entry now showing that JQ is installed in the new deployment. So in order to get access to that, I have to reboot. It's part of the trade-off. If you don't like it, then stick with Fedora Workstation. And while that reboots, we'll go on with more container tools. And if you were to do like one of these upgrades, yeah, would you have to then re-add the JQ back in it? No. So the question was, if we did an upgrade after I uh, did a pa uh, the install of JQ, would I have to re-add JQ? No. That's tracked as part of the, the deployment. So when you upgrade, the JQ package would be uh, would follow along the upgrade and also be upgraded as well if there is uh, upgrades available. Is that true whether or not you reboot into uh, wait, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand. You, said, uh, you can install JQ, yep. and then the, after that, if you upgrade, mm -hmm. the next upgrade includes JQ. Does that include even if you don't reboot into the new image with JQ? Yes, yeah. So, like when you do it, so the question was 
would JQ, would the layered package be upgraded even if you didn't reboot yet? If you did an RPM OS3 upgrade, that process brings in all the updates for the OS, including any uh, layered packages. So that applies against the image you haven't yet rebooted. Right, right. So it, it, it would apply to, uh, well, let's see. Uh, let, let's go back into this for a second. Whoops. So now that I'm in this new deployment with JQ, if I were to do another upgrade, actually, oh, I rolled back. That's a bunch. We can do it. We can do that. All right. So we're going to do an upgrade because I actually rolled back. I forgot. And this will actually show, be able to show the CVEs, I think. Um, so there's probably not an upgrade to JQ because it doesn't get upgraded very often. Uh, it's a pretty simple program, right? So in this case, yeah, in this case, I still have uh, the bits from the previous de the, the upgrade deployment on the host, so it didn't have to fetch uh, fetch the data from the, the network. Come on. So this is what I wanted to show earlier. So you can see now, the new deployment I have pending, it lists out all the security advisories that were fixed in this deployment, and the packages that were assigned to, the CVE numbers, uh, the package versions. So it's very helpful if you're security minded and you want to delay rebooting for whatever reason. Maybe you don't want to, you don't feel you need to take that upgrade uh, update right away. Um, very cool trick that RPM Moistry has learned. So Podme, again, uh, it's basically a drop-in replacement for the Docker CLI. If you were to do an alias Docker equals Podman, 99% Dan, 98%? Is he still is he paying attention? No, okay. <laughs> a lot of the Docker CLI commands are replicated in, in Podman, so you probably wouldn't know the difference. Um, doesn't have a daemon, so hashtag no big fat daemons for Dan. Um, and you, actually, you can also do uh, uh, rootless or unprivileged containers. So you, as a regular user, you can run uh, containers uh, using Podman. Scopio, very, I use it mostly for inspecting registries. Like I have a, uh, if I want to look at which tag is, uh, what like the, 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 the SHA-256 digest for a tag is, I can go and inspect the registry and get that kind of information. Or if I want to, I could actually copy, if you saw Sally and Ravashi's demo earlier this morning, they showed copying from the Docker daemon on your host to the Podman container storage. Very helpful to, to, to copy uh, existing images between the, the two container storages. And then Toolbox, I mentioned earlier, creates a mutable container for installing dev tools or any package on your host. Uh, it runs rootless, so you don't have to use sudo. Um, and it automatically mounts in your home directory. So let's try to do that. So the way I do that, I do toolbox, create. Oh, boy. Let's see if, this, let's see if the network can pl uh, plays along. So it's going it, to, it defaults to a Fedora toolbox uh, container, but you can specify any base image for your, your containers. So you could have one for Node.js. You could have one for uh, NPM, whatever the case may be. Or you can just have one big fat container that has all your tools uh, included, which is kind of the model I use, uh, rather than having multiple different containers to track network. All right, we're going to let that run. Could, could you have a toolbox with a different distributor? Yeah, you could do uh, in theory. <laughs> in theory. I don't know if this, the, I, I don't believe the toolbox supports the different distros right now. Uh, it's very Fedora specific, uh, but in theory, it could be done. Pull requests are welcome. Flat packs are the other side of the container story for Silverblue. Uh, it provides a way to containerize your GUI applications because the traditional OCI containers I just we, we just talked about with all those tools are good for command line tools. Uh, like JQ, for example, S-Trace, GCC, that kind of stuff. But if you want to containerize a GUI, it gets a little 
gnarly unless you're Jesse Frizzell and have a bunch of Docker files that does all that for you. Um, so it, Flatpaks actually uses libos tree as well to, to store the data uh, for the runtimes required to run the GUIs and the apps themselves on the disk. Uh, uses bubble wrap for unprivileged users. Can talk to Dbus and systemd. Apps are distributed via the OCI image format or through o, uh, OS tree uh, repos as well. And this kind of opens up the distribution model a little bit more where you can just distribute a single flat pack with all the different dependencies to a different to an, uh, a flat pack repo and then the Ubuntu guys can run it, the, the, the Arch guys can run it, the Fedora guys can run it for ladies or guys, I want to be inclusive. Um, but it, it's, you know, it takes the container uh, story to the next level for, for GUI apps. So going back to Toolbox for a second, I've got the Fedora Toolbox container created. To go into it, I simple as that. I can do and this is just doing uh, normal DNF stuff inside a container. This is no big deal, right? So let's sort of, uh, let's go to the actual GUI part of it, and we're going to see if I'm going to try to install a flat pack, and hopefully, the network cooperates. So Silverbow ships uh, Firefox as part of the host. Uh, we could, we're, we're waiting for the Firefox flat pack to mature before we take Firefox completely out of the host because we've had instances where we've removed certain applications from the host that had flat packs and people complain because they expect them to be there by default. Uh, the most popular flat pack, uh, flat pack repo is called Flat Hub. Has anybody used flat packs or flat hub before? couple of people, cool. So, similar to the way we have, uh, similar to the way RPM OS tree has an OS tree repo for getting its data, we need to install a flat pack OS tree repo on our host. Probably could have done this ahead of time, but now you get to Feel the pain I feel. So, one thing I didn't mention is that uh, if you use GNOME, we have the GNOME software uh, capability, and GNOME software understands flat packs and understands RPM OS tree. The support for RPM OS tree is, isn't the greatest, as well as flat pack. There are some rough edges. You may hit errors if you go through the, uh, the GNOME software route. Um, but each release gets better. We hope it to be completely seamless before we turn it over as like the potential default replacement for uh, Fedora Workstation. So in the background, you saw the uh, DNF install um, of S-Trace completed in the toolbox. If I exit the toolbox and then go back in, S-Trace is there. If I look at my home directory, it's the same thing as uh, in the home directory in the host. So if I exit out, somewhere, the same stuff. So, pretty handy way to uh, move away from installing your development tools and libraries on your host and keep them containerized. Uh, all right, so we got a flat, a flat hub installed. I'm going to go back to. Terminal on this VM. Let's see if I can make this bigger for y'all. Uh, so flat. So we use Flatpak search. Let's say Spotify for example. I know that's. Or I can just go to the Flat Hub. Group. That 
Lights. Yeah, great. So flat pack install. I've got this the Spotify client. Oops, too many. So it's gonna ask for uh, necessary permissions to install it. Do you want the, the run times? Yeah, of course I do. Do I do all this? Of course. Yes, I want to listen to music on Spotify. So now it's going to pull down the, the different run times. You've got uh, the platform, which is basically the, the, the core of it, basically. The core of the, the library is required to run these GUI applications from free desktop. Uh, some codecs, uh, localization files. We're going to let that run while I keep going forward before I run out of time. So, that's a whirlwind tour through all the technology. Um, if you haven't been paying attention to Solar Blue lately, uh, one of the we've had some uh, some nice uh, improvements to the, the the experience. Before we had a limitation where you couldn't install software that was installing to slash opt, namely Google Chrome is one of the big requests that we had. Like, why can't I install Google Chrome? I don't want to use Chromium. Thankfully, Alex Larson stepped in made some changes to RPM OS tree, and now we can install Google Chrome to slash opt. Not all stuff, not all the software is gonna work that goes into that opt, but Google Chrome is at least unblocked. We also have support for NVIDIA drivers, so if you have those high performance GPUs for running games and whatnot, or you know, machine learning tasks, whatever the case may be, we have support for installing those as well, which uh, kind of unlocks another use case of the workstation. Uh, again, Alex Larson from the GNOME team uh, at Red Hat was uh, the, the responsible for both of those changes, so thank God, thank goodness for him. Going forward, we want to enable automatic OS upgrades by default. I forgot to show you that, but it's an easy like one-line fix to a config file. When it, when automatic upgrades are enabled on an RP, these RPM OS three systems, the upgrades are downloaded in the background and staged. And then you can choose to reboot into them whenever you want. It happens just without even you knowing. It's a little system D service. It's great. Uh, we want to install more flat packs out of the box. We weren't able to do that up till now because Fedora didn't have a flat pack registry. We're starting to see more flat packs be uh, produced by Fedora, so we'll, we'll be able to enable the flat pack Fedora the Fedora flat pack registry on new installs. Users will be able to install flat packs from that registry. Um, we can't distribute FlatHub because of probably legal reasons. I don't, I'm not a lawyer. Don't quote me on that. Um, and there's been talk of making Silverblue the default workstation choice. It's very contentious. We have one fan back there. Thank you. Very contentious because some people are really want to hold on to the DNF workflow because they love it so much. But the, I mean, if you've ever done a DNF upgrade and it's gone south in the middle of it left with a system that's broken. RPM OS tree is the thing you are looking for. Um, so maybe, I don't know, 31 is not going to be the default for, for workstation, but maybe in a couple years we'll, we'll be at a place where we can do that. The other developments that we're, we're starting to talk about is building Silverblue through uh, a new tool that have been, has been developed for building Fedora CoreOS and Red Hat CoreOS called CoreOS Assembler. It's essentially a wrapper around RPM OS tree and uh, a, a number of tools, basically, to produce a OS uh, using uh, the OS tree format. Uh, Colin Walter is one of the key contributors, one of the, the architect of OS tree and RPM OS tree. He's been hacking on this, trying to get us to a point where we can use CoreOS similar to build any RPM OS tree based uh, uh, OS, so that'd be pretty cool if that happens. Then, of course, like improving the documentation and growing the community, we want our documentation is a little lacking right now. We could use more help in that area for sure. Um, and then just growing the community, getting more users up, uh, in, on board, trying it out, reporting problems. You can do this, do that through here. We have a great uh, discourse forum uh, that's up and running. We have docs that are that, like I said, need updating. We have an issue tracker on GitHub for reporting issues, and we have a Twitter handle for Silverblue for um, tweeting problems to us or solution or suggestions, whatever. Thanks for coming to my DevCom talk. You can get in touch with me at Twitter or an email uh, via those things there. So, questions? You serve in the back.
running it on my laptop at home, on my kids' laptops, fantastic, brilliant, yeah. everyone should use it. A um, couple of things. I think there's still room to improve the availability of flat packs. Things like there's no Tor browser, and that's an important thing for lots of people who, who are in open source. Uh, and things like GNOME Tweak Tool doesn't run, which means you can't restore sessions or you can't have startup. It's, it's things like that. It's not fully usable yet, and I encourage people to, to use it, but it's a fantastic piece of work, and keep doing it. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. I agree. The flat pack, the, there are lo those rough edges that we need to polish off and make it a little more usable. Like We need to be able to give it to uh, a no, uh, not a developer, basically, not someone who's willing to dig into the, the, the journal and figure out problems and say, Oh, do you want to install Spotify? Well, just go through GNOME software, search Spotify, and install it, and you're good to go. So, we have improved, we have usability improvements for sure. Anything else, Neil? So this looks quite interesting, and it seems to have advanced a fair bit since the last time I attempted to use it, and it kind of stalled out on installation. So that that's good, um, but I. Gnome is not my bag. What are you? Uh, are you looking to like collaborate with some of the other desktop groups within within Fedora to see if we can get some interesting flavors uh, made? Um, like for example, KDE using Wayland with this because with this new model, it's a lot easier to experiment with that kind of thing. Or trying out uh, Mate with their new experimental Mirko, which is also Wayland, and things like that, giving people an opportunity to try the new tech with the kind of desktops they like in the brave new world of maybe secure? So Neil's question was, I don't, I'm not a GNOME user. How do I use additional or different uh, desktop environments, basically? So there's two ways. You can actually just pack, you can actually just RPM OS reinstall KDE or whatever on top of that thing, on top of the existing Silverblue installation, and then at boot choose which uh, desktop environment you want to go into. Clearly that's not the optimized uh, path. There is a community member who maintains his own OS tree repos of a KDE version, XFCE, Deepin, uh, a number of different desktop environments, i3 I think. So it's possible to rip out all the GNOME stuff and put in a new desktop environment and have it work. I also would love to see a different spin of, uh, of Silver Blue for the users who want a different desktop environment. I don't know of any official talks that have happened in that regard, but it's certainly possible. We have the community to support behind it. Maybe we need, just need to link up the right people to make it happen. Um, but yeah, so the answer is kind of. Someone else. I've I've not used Silver Blue yet, but I've been using flat packs on regular Fedora. And one thing I've noticed when like installing some of the um, audio recording and music notation software, many of them depend on KDE dependencies. Okay. And some of the things I noticed were um, it was using up a lot of disk space because different programs were downloading different versions of the different KDE um, uh, dependencies. So is that just like good distro version hygiene that just hasn't happened because it's not a concerted distro-wide effort yet? Or would that be an ongoing problem where maybe developers are not updating to the latest version of libraries and so we end up with a lot of extra different versions of everything? Right, so the question was basically like, what do we do about flat pack, flat pack bloat where Different flat packs are installing different versions of the same supporting libraries. Um, I would say that it's probably best solved by, right now, it's probably best solved by the individual flat pack owners. So, whatever sound recording software you were d d talking about, they need to stay as up to date as possible, as, long, as, as well as all the other flat packs. Like, I really don't have a good answer for that. It's a, but it's a. I understand the problem. I understand the problem there. Um, there's somebody on the forums who was just complaining about how this is like no. Flat packs are no different than if you ever installed installed a, a game from the Steam store. They on Windows they install all these different DLLs versions for the same libraries, but because it's 
it, they've been versioned differently, you have to install them. So it's a similar problem. I'm not sure we have a good solution for that right now. Dan? Has there been, um, so Toolbox um, is really cool from a developer point of view, but a lot of times I might be setting up a service to run out of System D. Um, has System D become aware of what's going on with Toolbox yet so that could I set up a container image that at boot time would start a service inside of my container? So Dan asked, can I set up a systemd service to start a toolbox container? Is that a good summary? Yeah, I'm more complex than that, though. I want to install Apache inside of my toolbox's root, as you were showing, and I want at boot time, I'm going to enable that system service and then have Apache come in, go into my container, and start that service. Okay, so... So Dan wants a systemd service to start a toolbox which also has Apache inside of it. And that service is started as well when the container uh, starts. I mean, wouldn't you just use a regular pod bit, like a regular OCI container for that? Well, no, because I wouldn't have Apache installed in my system. So I have to install Apache inside of a container, and then I need to... Uh, it just, I mean, my normal workflow would be to... Uh, bottom line is, is System D starting to look All right, at so how they can interact better with with sort of this new silver blue type environment where people are installing software inside okay. the containers. So, so what Dan really wants to know is, has, this, has System D has System D become aware of how we're doing, uh, how Silver Blue is handling user containers like Toolbox and whatnot? And uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know of any yeah. uh, new new developments in that in that case. Any other questions? So this is probably more of a flat pack interoperability, but I was running flat pack with some open source graphical applications. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they couldn't do, they would try unsuccessfully, like you were working on an object and you could open it you know, there's like a right click and open it in another open source image editor. Yep. And on a normal DNF system, that works great. Right. But in a flat pack system, because they're launched differently, however yep. they were launching it, it fails. Yep. So, so, so the question is basically, uh, let's see if I can summarize this. When you're using flat packs, it's hard for the flat packs to communicate with each other, essentially, right? So what? trying to launch, uh, trying to trigger an event from one flat pack to another just is not... Uh, not easily done right now. Flatpak does have support for what they call portals, um, and that gives you access to, uh, basically opens up the Flatpak with different permissions to talk to uh, Dbus, for example, or uh, even to different uh, Flatpaks, I believe. So, or, or access the, you can even have a portal to access uh, the file system itself. So uh, it seems technically feasible. Uh, I, I think as the Flatpaks are, uh, becoming more widely adopted and more understood in, in terms of how to package them, uh, we'll see more. We'll see better integration in that regard. Um, right now, it's more along the lines of taking whatever flat pack you have, figuring out the right changes you need to make to that flat pack to open it up to for access to other flat packs or to the system, and then running it that way. Um, for this is one of those, you know, in, in terms of uh, improve usability improvements, like one that we have to keep striving towards. Any other questions? <laughs> so Dan's asking if Red Hat is going to replace their CSB corporate desktops with Silver Blue. It's a tall order, Dan. I don't know. I don't know. So that's, that's above my pay grade. I agree. So Dan's pointing out this is a perfect corporate desktop because you don't need root. You can install packages in your, your user space containers. You have flat packs. It's just like it. you can deliver updates at the cadence you want through OS uh, through your own custom OS tree repos. It's, there is a lot of benefit to using it, using this method for uh, question in the back. You can yell. I can try to repeat it. Hi, 
have a question and this regards to the Red Hat and I understand Red Hat they have their, their own cloud system I don't know if I'm permitted to ask this question but um, if you understand about Amazon AWS everything is on cloud based but I was doing my research I'm just kind of I'm trying to find out how is Red Hat trying to work with other cloud system so you can access other cloud system like uh, Microsoft or AWS through Red Hat because I think that's a big challenge right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm just really thinking, I mean, I'm just kind of imagining what is Red Hat really doing about it since I'm really trying to take the certification. Okay. Well, the question is uh, how is Red Hat uh, working with other cloud providers besides AWS? Man, that's way above my pay grade. I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I know, I mean, for, well, for example, on the OpenShift side, we have support for AWS. We're working to support uh, other cloud providers such as Azure and GCP. Um, Terry sounds like he's going to answer this question for me. Yeah, I, I might be able to help a little. Are you thinking in terms of like something like this, like Silverblue desktop experience or general? Okay. So at, at the risk of stealing their thunder for this topic, we could talk outside, but we have tons of teams working with all of the cloud partners. We have a certified cloud partnership, and we have a ton of management tooling and certification efforts to support all of the clouds. So we can talk more later, though. Any other questions? The server side? So, <laughs> so the question was, what, where's the server side for this? Well, this was actually birthed out of Atomic, Atomic Host. So Red Hat and Fedora and CentOS had a, a server, side, server version of it called Atomic Host. Used the same uh, uh, infrastructure or technology, OS3 and RPM OS3. It never really took off as well as, as much as we wanted to. Now, uh, what we're doing is we're using that same technology to provide a mutable host uh, in a server format for OpenShift. So OpenShift 4 uses uh, RHEL Core OS as the uh, default OS, the only OS actually supported for all the masters and the control plane uh, workload uh, in OpenShift. Uh, other than that, uh, Red Hat does not have a RHEL 8 based offering using RPM OS 3. There is a RHEL 7 version of uh, Atomic Host, which uses RPM OS3, but given that RHEL 8 has been released, RHEL 7 is not long for this world, essentially. Anything else? There's another one right there. Uh, up till now, I have been using my desktop as uh, partly server, running libvirt and other things. Uh, how do you see that happening once we go here? Do you suggest that we have a dedicated desktop which runs Silverblue and a Fedora server version somewhere else doing the desktop thing, uh, server things or the intention is to run Libvirt and other things also? Yeah, okay. So, how, how do you, so basically, it's how do you run Libvirt on Silverblue, essentially? All you have to do is package layer it, um, install the, the Libvirt packages and you can still interact on the host level, use vert install to install uh, images, uh, run vert. I mean, I'm, this laptop right now is running Silverblue, and I'm running, uh, no, hold on. Boop. So I've got vert manager right here. Uh, whoops. I got a couple of VMs in Versh right now, so it just works. Any more? Going once. Great. Thanks for coming, guys. And ladies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of questions.